Princeton University's Keller Center, educating leaders for a technology-driven society. I'll use this. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, good afternoon. Thank you for coming. I'd like to do three basic things today. I'd like to talk a little bit together with you about what is social entrepreneurship. I'd like to try and make an opportunity for the wonderful students from Princeton who are in my SE lab to come up and say a little bit about their projects. We have two forms for that. One is a 90 second pitch form and the other is a, a um, one team has a longer presentation. And I have um, some special sheets that we use in our SE lab to help give feedback to the students that we can also model some of the exercises that we do in SE lab. And the last thing is, time permitting, I'll try to explain to you some of the aspects of the model of the Social Entrepreneurship Collaboratory that I first started at Stanford and then brought to Harvard and then I am um, very thankful to have had the opportunity to come to, to Princeton to do that and I want to take a moment to thank a few of the people that are involved with that. So uh, f first, the uh, wonderful uh, Sherrod Malik, who is the faculty director of the Keller Center, which has been a wonderful home for me and a very, very important place to be able to do uh, my work in a, in a supported way. And the team at Keller Center, Cornelia, Stephanie, and Victoria. And um, thanks to Vince Poor, the dean at the engineering school, for giving a very warm welcome to myself and my family. Um, my students, who are quite wonderful, and as uh, Sherrod said, we have 74 students in the SE lab, and it's, it's an overwhelming experience for me. Um, so many uh, bright students and so many interesting ideas and so many, uh, such deep passion for social change in the world. It's, uh, it's a great group to have. Um, there are two people that, that are involved with the lab as, um, as core members of the team who aren't enrolled students, uh, uh, an undergraduate student and a graduate student. A graduate student is Derek Willis, who is a PhD candidate in science, technology, and environmental policy at Woodrow Wilson School. And in addition to trying to uh, finish up his dissertation, he is spending an, an enormous amount of time giving advice and mentoring students here in trying to help them to coax their passion into reality and to work on their social change projects. And undergraduate uh, Rachel Steinberg, um, Rachel right here, who um, I discovered had been in, is a Woodrow Wilson student and a senior at Princeton and has a wonderful work experience at, um, in South Africa and at the, the, uh, the Millennium Challenge Corporation and also with the Grassroots Business Fund, a World Bank spinoff. Uh, and, and I believe deeply that when you do this type of work, and I really want to try and, and approach this idea with you today, how do you make this type of learning lab, this type of transformative learning model, live and thrive in a university. And that's the problem I've been struggling with through three universities now. And um, Rachel is a great example of one of the answers. The, one of the answers is you collaborate and you, you partner with students. And for me, that's part of the solution. When you have that bridge, you have a dynamic and energetic situation. And when you act in an island and when you, set, you have a, a silo for your academic discipline, you lose all that, that enlivening aspect of the transformative educational model. So that is the sort of core of my, of my message on that. Um, also the, the Keller family and the, and the Kellner family for their support of both the Keller Center and also this professorship that I hold. And um, uh, Dean Chris Paxton at the Woodrow Wilson School who um, immediately, even before I had arrived, um, embraced um, myself and my wife who is Princeton class of 86 uh, my wife, Sarah Singer, who's a, um, a professor at Harvard School of Public Health and Harvard Medical School, and um, convinced us that it was okay to bring the whole family down to Princeton, which is what we have done happily. And I should also note that my, um, my, my children, Audrey and Jason, who are here in the audience today, um, and uh, Audrey is very important because she is my bellwether for understanding how things are going. 
and my barometer for understanding if I'm doing things that are too complicated. So I try them out on Audrey first, and it's a very, very good method. Um, my mother and father, uh, David and Phyllis Bloom, who have come down from Boston today, and my um, mother, mother-in-law and father-in-law, my father-in-law, uh, Susan and Saul Singer, my father-in-law, Saul, is class of 59, and I attended his uh, 50th reunion last uh, May and got the introduction of my life uh, <laughs> to, uh, to Princeton activities. So anyway, long thank yous, but let's, let's uh, talk a little bit about social entrepreneurship. So um, what is social entrepreneurship? Sometimes I start with my students with this quote, Tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? Mary Oliver's The Summer Day. Because the first aspect of social entrepreneurship that I think for the students, which is incredibly important, is aligning themselves and their passion with what is meaningful for them. So in order to be able to express that in a place like Princeton, for instance, or the rest of us who are outside of the university in our lives, it's a very difficult thing. And so that's the first principle in the Social Entrepreneurship Collaboratory, or the SE Lab. How do you align yourself with things that you deeply believe are meaningful and express that in your life? So for me, that's the core of it, because that's how you create social mission. Um, somewhat along the lines of that, I wondered what my own story was. And it took me until I was about 48, which is last year, to realize what that was. Now, this is a picture of my grandmother, who uh, in 1914, doing some pottery and, and decorating and painting some pottery in Boston. My grandmother was an a immigrant girl um, uh, who came to the United States, uh, sort of poor, 1901, and um, in some ways was raised out of her poverty by an interesting social program in Boston that had these immigrant girls who were Jewish and Italian working on pottery and um, gave them, um, act, they went to, the, they had a library club, and they had their lives opened up in new ways. And this was something that was in my um, my family legacy, and I didn't really understand it, and I didn't get it until we convened a some a symposium, my father and I had the occasion to speak at this symposium at Harvard, and all of a sudden in the middle of it I had this realization. And anyway, so for me that was my lightning flash about how that had been an important story in my family's history, and also I believe for my father, in uh, sort of connecting with the sense of values of trying to change yourself and trying to realize new opportunities, and how America, really that was one of the fundamental dreams of America, and how can we expand that in a more global sense. So aligning, again, aligning with yourself and that important and meaningful aspects of your life. And then how can you express that? And how do we do that in the States, which is part of what students in my class do? And how do we do that globally? Because, of course, the problems that we face globally are enormous. This is a very, very scary time for our globe. We are consuming our resources at an enormous rate. There are billions of people who are in desperate poverty. We have health crises. We have economic problems. We have violence. We have wars. So this is an extraordinarily difficult moment. And how is social entrepreneurship going to approach that? Now comes the part of the talk which I think is a little bit drier, and which makes me in some ways kind of concerned. If you want to know what social entrepreneurship is, definition. First, we have to talk about what entrepreneurship is. And I think that social entrepreneurship, in a lot of ways, is simply entrepreneurship with a social mission. In order to understand that, you have to decide what you want to believe that entrepreneurship is and what social mission is. Not an easy thing. Here's one definition of entrepreneurship. The pursuit of opportunity regardless of the resources you currently control. I'm sure that Ed Shaw in the front now knows that that's Howard Stevenson's um, uh, contribution from uh, Harvard Business School. Social entrepreneurship, the pursuit of opportunity to create pattern-breaking social change. Pattern-breaking social change, regardless of the resources you currently control. That's one definition of social entrepreneurship. I say that it combines the passion of a social mission with entrepreneurial practices that are historically associated with the private sector, the business sector. So the practices that have gone on in, in, in corporations and in businesses as strategy, finance, marketing, organizational behavior aspects, those are co-opted by what was traditionally a nonprofit sector. So you have this now blurring of sectoral boundaries. Innovative nonprofit sector organizations, social purpose business ventures, and entrepreneurial government organizations. A little diagram of that. And it's this nonprofit sector area which is the one that has a difficult name problem. We know fairly well, and these, these bubbles are not in proportion. In the United States, 
the private sector is the biggest bubble. In a lot of um, developing world countries, the public sector is the bi biggest bubble. The one that I'm mostly interested in is the intersection between this nonprofit sector bubble and the other bubbles there. The nonprofit sector bubble is alternately called the independent sector, the citizen sector, if you're a, 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 an acolyte of Ashoka. Um, the voluntary sector, if you've come from the UK, that's a common term there. This is where nonprofit organizations, NGOs, civil society organizations inhabit. So we talk about also an equilibrium shift as being an important aspect of social entrepreneurship. In this scheme, which is done by Sally Osberg from the Skoll Foundation and, and uh, Roger Martin, who's uh, the dean of the uh, Robert School in uh, Toronto, the management school, um, you see that social entrepreneurship in that, 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 uh, in that corner is combining both the aspects of direct action and also this new sense of creating an equilibrium, a new equilibrium, shifting the way that things happen. Is this like the model of microfinance, for instance? Taking millions of people out of poverty by changing the way that the game is played. So that's what you ideally want to do if you're a social entrepreneur. Now, the more classical form here with, of direct, direct action, social service provision, and this, the, for equilibrium shifting, we've often had that done in the public sector with figures like Gandhi and um, Desmond Tutu, Nelson Mandela. Um, that's more the political leadership and advocacy, Kennedy, Churchill. Shifting that equilibrium, the way that we live our lives, the assumptions that we have about how we go about what, doing what we're doing and the incentives that we have to do that. So it's a behavioral type of analysis and it's often grounded in economics. Another definition for you, Ds. Social entrepreneurs play the role of social change agents, so that key part of social change agents. How do you galvanize social change? Adopting a mission to create and sustain social value, not just private value. Pursuing opportunities that serve the social mission. Engaging in a process of innovation, continuous innovation, adaptation, and learning. I'm going to talk a little bit more about innovation. I was delighted to be in an innovation center at Princeton. That gave me an opportunity to suddenly think much more deeply about innovation as a question. And it was, it's a great topic that we've been pursuing in the class. How do you approach innovation? And I'm going to talk about that just a teeny bit um, when we go forward. Acting boldly without being limited by resources currently in hand. Wow, are students good at that? <laughs> so a natural inclination to being social entrepreneurs. Exhibiting a heightened sense of accountability to the constituency served and for the outcomes created. This notion of measurement, transparency and measurement, both together. I'll put them both in there. Now, innovation. When I first came to the Keller Center, I started thinking about innovation. I started looking at the work of Clay Christensen also at Harvard, who, and, and some of his colleagues from places like the New Profit Inc. social venture capital firm in Boston. And I started thinking about disruptive and sustainable uh, forms of innovation. And I started thinking that mostly innovation is considered in the engineering school at Princeton, and this is my outside perspective, and if I get it wrong, that's the way, uh, sort of, I'm, I'm sorry. But the classical mode is about technological innovation. And this, for me, is represented by something like the cell phone. Now, the cell phone is an incredibly powerful tool. And if you look at Grameen Bank and the Grameen phone, and the example of Iqbal Qadir, who started Grameen phone in Bangladesh to help people get out of poverty by using their cell phones and by having village phone uh, people who were the entrepreneurs that were there. And an enormous amount of productivity and connectivity came from that. You compare that to microfinance, which I call a social innovation. So we think of both of them in this laboratory. We think of both technological innovation and social innovation. And for me, as I say, microfinance is a good example of social innovation because in microfinance, you have a lending circle. It's the, the idea is not necessarily dependent on some sort of um, in, important uh, chip or some sort of great new scientific breakthrough. It's more of a social science breakthrough. It's more of an organizational question. It's more of a question of designing how that community works. And that's the innovation of microfinance. Um, what are some more examples? Now, I talked a little bit about microfinance. Muhammad Yunus, I think, is a classic example of social innovation. Bank, the Grameen Bank itself and his models for microfinance have lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty 
and connecting to the sort of millennium development goal of getting, um, reducing poverty by half by 2015. Which if we do reach, I think a lot of it will be due to that one particular social innovation. So that's, that's a huge um, uh, advance for how we deal with that particular question. And so much of the social um, progress that we make is connected to the question of poverty. So much of the issues around conflict and violence are connected to the issues of poverty. So as we become more capable in realizing ways to get out of poverty, we are so far in advancing how we become a more liberal, democratic, pluralistic society. As we compete over resources, as we fight these wars that we have, we have exponentially increased the challenges of having peace and prosperity. Um, another good example for me is Ashoka. Um, innovators for the public and the leadership of Bill Drayton, who um, I consider to be the fountainhead of social entrepreneurship. So the last 25, 30 years, Bill's been working in the field, really defining what we think of as social entrepreneurship. A global NGO that invests in social entrepreneurs, creating dramatic and lasting social impact. Now, Bill likes to tell a story which is rooted in the um, economics of um, William Baumel, who uh, has had a more than 50 year affiliation with Princeton, the economist. I'm sure a number of you had to suffer through Baumel and Blinder textbooks, so, um, or maybe you enjoyed it. Uh, I always found economics a little bit the dismal science. I believe in that. Uh, in any case, the idea here is that from Rome to 2000, we're looking at the GDP growth and productivity over that time. And there was an enormous explosion in the 18th century through the 18th, 20%, 19th, 200%, 20th century, 700% increase in this, in this way that business became competitive and with the increase in GDP. And as the productivity took off, society benefited. Now the social sector did not participate in this incredible growth and explosion of productivity that the private sector was enjoying. What Bill Drayton has been seeing is a shift where the social sector is now understanding in social entrepreneurship how to be more competitive, productive, and take entrepreneurship as being a way of galvanizing what's happening on the social agenda, the social change agenda. One of the ways we see that is the explosion of civil society organizations, of nonprofit organizations, of these voluntary uh, organizations. You can see in Brazil, for instance, that between 1980 and 2001, they increased from 5,000 to 1 million of these organizations. Some of this is due to the change in government systems. We have a fall, sort of the fall of the Berlin Wall and the collapse of the Soviet Union, the spread of, of liberal democracies, the um, decrease in the number of governments in South America run in dictatorship. You know, as these social forces are unleashed, we have an enormous change in society. So, what is this SE Lab? I, I, um, my experience was that, that students, and this is based on my own experience, it was that students were not really given the opportunity that they needed to flourish on their own and to take the ideas that they received in classrooms, the academic frameworks, and to translate that into action in society and to have a passion around that. And so instead of, you know, and I think a little bit about this model that I call the ascendancy of, of transformational education. And for me that means that if students are simply given a way of reading books, reading articles, sort of listening to the talking head professor, which I'm being at the moment, and uh, then going and writing papers and taking exams, that this is, it's one important form of education. But it's really very, very, it's not as dynamic and it's not as connected to the real world as I think we need to have some aspect of the, especially undergraduate education, to be. And so I wanted to create something for my students at Stanford who I saw sort of struggling with this issue. And then I had this idea that I would launch this lab. And I, um, I was in the Institute for International Studies at Stanford and there were two thinkers there, Jim March and Woody Powell. And they had a little uh, something that they called a collaboratory, a knowledge collaboratory. And so I said, this is great. I found these guys and I sort of co-opted this term collaboratory. Who is using this term? I want to know where this comes from. And um, so then I started this class and all of a sudden they started becoming interested in the class. Everyone was coming to the class. 
and they wanted to know, you know, like, what was this class and you know what was this collaboratory thing. So the guys who invented the collaboratory term came over to me and they said, well, you know, what are you doing with the collaboratory? This is really, you know, we're kind of interested in expanding this idea too. And so I said, well, great, there's room for both of us. Let's just, you know, keep going. Uh, and we did. And they got a nice gift and they started something called the Kosmetsky Global Collaboratory. Um, I think partially because I, I kicked their butt. <laughs> and you know, they got excited and they said, okay, we can do this. You know, if that guy over there could do it, then we can get it going too. And then um, Sarah and I did a runner to, uh, to the East Coast and went to Harvard. Um, and the collaboratory is still going on at, at Stanford in two different forms. Uh, in any case, I realized, both from my own experience as a student and also from what I was seeing with my students at Stanford, that this was a dire need. And, and they came because it was in done in partnership with them and it activated them in ways that um, allowed them to express what they wanted to express. Uh, I, I wrote this model up in, in a publication which is shamefully expensive. I had, believe me, I received no benefit whatsoever. Um, but uh, Oxford Press came out with an edited uh, volume, uh, 23 different authors, and I contributed a chapter which I, where I wrote up what happened to, um, at Stanford and at Harvard with the SE lab. And so that was actually important for me because what I wanted the lab model to be is freeware. I wanted it to be freely available. I wanted people to be able, it wasn't freely available in that book, but I posted the paper to the, to, uh, the Hauser Center for Nonprofit Organizations at Harvard, which is also a wonderful incubator for these ideas. And then it's freeware, so it's up and it's free. But that's not enough because you have to have a live model. So this notion of vision to reality, university education rarely focuses its attention, this is a bit out of the book, uh, and imagination on teaching students how to turn a vision into reality, how to design and develop social change organizations. Well, part of that is true and part of that is a crock. Why is it a crock? Because most of my students, most of my wonderful students who are sitting, many of them sitting here, um, they know that they can't necessarily do what it is that they plan to do and that doesn't matter. What matters is that they understand how to take their ideas and put some form around them and communicate them to other people and develop them inside themselves and collaborate between their, you know, amongst, in, inside their team and between different teams and between teams around the university and, and outside as they go and as they do all over the world and take their ideas and their passion all over the world. So that's what matters. But the notion is you can take something in your head and you can translate it into your action in the world. And they do. And they have. Um, another thing that I think is incredibly important in making this work in a university, and this is important to me because basically it's what I've been doing, it's, it's been my life for the last eight years, um, is to align the, the lab itself with the values of the university, of the environment, of the organization. Now, universities are just big nonprofit organizations, so they're, and actually some of them are very entrepreneurial. Some of them are quite sort of ossified in their behavior, and Harvard is one of the worst, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, I'm delighted to say that I've discovered at Princeton that you can actually do a lot of stuff. And you actually, you, you show up and people actually are interested in, in your showing up. And this is a great thing. This is a very good sign for the future of Princeton. Um, so Princeton in the nation's service and in the service of all nations, that just sort of floored me. I mean, I couldn't even tell you what exact, I know a lot more about Stanford in some ways than I do about Harvard for when, being able to frame up uh, a mission for the university. The Kennedy School, which was my, uh, the Harvard Kennedy School has been, you know, the place that I've been incubating my idea at Harvard. And that, you know, th that has a very specific mission. And, um, and, that, and it's, it's quite social, uh, public service driven. So that's wonderful. Well, what I found at Stanford, right in my face, was this in the nation's service, and then I understand it was expanded to, in the service of all nations, which said it right there. Right, Audrey? Said it right there. And then the Keller Center also seemed to have a fascinating mission. And the way I interpreted it from reading some of the literature that was sent out that included an announcement of the, the, uh, the original gift and the, how all these uh, people came together last spring in April for the creation and the founding of the, and of the Keller Center. Um, Keller Center for Innovation in Engineering Education prepares students to be leaders in an increasingly complex, technologically driven society. I loved that. So I said, okay, great. And then another thing I saw, and I asked Sherwood when I came, I said, can you tell me how I can align with the university? What's going on? And I said, I've seen this thing about these grand challenges. They sound very interesting to me. There's energy, there's development, and there's health. And that sounds like a very, very a great space. And we're looking at infectious diseases in health, 
and my wife is a sort of a health policy, you know, sort of scholar, and they're they're looking in development, and they're interested in eliminating poverty in Africa, and there's you know the, the energy and the environment piece is very important. So that's what I did. I started looking around for things that were going on on campus. Now I'm going to segue to another thing for you, which sort of go the opposite direction. I told my wife to hide the kids' eyes. Um, I'm just going to. Um, my vision has been declining. It happens at about 45. Um, so I'm going to read this for you. It's disturbing, but we use it as a, as a, as a uh, way in our... I'll tell you afterwards. I'll read it first, and then we'll, we'll talk about it for, for just a moment. The photo in the mail is the Pulitzer Prize-winning photo taken in 1994 during the Sudan famine. The picture depicts a famine-stricken child crawling towards a United Nations food camp located a kilometer away. The vulture is waiting for the child to die so they can eat it. This picture shocked the whole world. No one knows what happened to the child, including the photographer Kevin Carter, who left the place as soon as the photograph was taken. Three months later, he committed suicide due to depression. Now, we, this photograph, obviously uh, um, incredibly disturbing, we try to use uh, in a lot of different ways. But one of the ways is to understand the seriousness and the significance of what the students are proposing. We want, whenever possible, to be engaged with issues that have serious social significance. And we want to understand how to create the most social value and have the largest impact we can for the small amount of resources that we have at our disposal. Um, now, I can't take you through um, I, there are many, 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 many exercises and many, many different frameworks that we use in our laboratory. And as my, my students well know, we, we, we talk about um, the strategic triangle and competitive strategy, and we talk about the theory of change, and we talk about logic models, and we, we look at uh, all sorts of different frameworks that are helpful for us in trying to understand how to design their ventures. And, but that, you know, I think the best way to explain that is to ask the students just to say a little bit about what they're working on. So uh, I'd just like to invite up, uh, we have different teams who will, who will uh, come and will give you uh, their, um, their pitch or their presentation. So uh, bridging the gap. And let me know if you need uh, a slide or anything like that. I have a couple of slides here. For you guys, here's the mic, OK? Yep. Thank you. OK. As a native Colombian who has recently worked in Bogota, I've witnessed the difficulty that young working Colombians often have in financing their graduate education. In fact, due to this problem, Americans are four times more likely than Colombians to obtain a graduate degree. Numerous studies, including a seminal work by the World Bank, indicate that this is a critical problem that must be overcome for Colombian economic growth to continue. So we already mentioned, the primary cause of the problem is a lack of financing to pursue graduate education. Tuition costs are extremely high, standing at about 66% of an average Colombian's annual income. Moreover, uncertainty about career prospects simply makes the opportunity cost to pursue a graduate education too great for the average working Colombian. Our organization, Bridging the Gap, proposes to solve this problem by implementing a unique two-year specialization degree program that is financed by corporate partners is offered within the existing Columbian University system and is part-time, which allows employees of corporations to continue in their positions of full-time employment, employment while attending school. So another key part of the Bridging the Gap Specialization Program that differentiates it from other specialization programs is a research and development thesis, which will take place in the second year of the program. So the research and development thesis will cover a topic that is innovative and uh, will cover a topic of research that is particularly in line with the employer's needs of the student. Uh, and then finally, Bridging the Gap will mandate that the student, the student and the employer, because it's a part-time program, uh, that the student continue working for the employer once the degree is completed, uh, that way to help eliminate brain drain and contribute to, um, which, help eliminate brain drain which currently contributes to Columbia's socioeconomic stagnation and inequality. I, I just want to say two things. One, I apologize for making you all feel underdressed, uh, just in class. Uh, but really, more importantly, just to thank you, Professor Bloom, to give us an opportunity to come up and you know, present the project that we've really been developing in this class. So, thanks. Thank you.
and we have food justice co-ops. Some of the groups, you know what, everyone has been so incredibly busy, I'm just enormously impressed that, that the students were able to come at all this evening. And we also, Thanks, Professor. We also just had our, our midterm last night. <laughs> so uh, these guys were all, um, you know, putting their uh, their nose to the grindstone. Oh, if you want to use the yeah. microphone. No, no, no. Okay. I'm okay. <laughs> um, so thank you guys. And you also, you just, uh, I'll ask you just to quickly introduce yourselves, so your names and your majors or something like um, that. Yep. So. My name is Tushar Gupta. I'm a junior majoring in computer science. And I'm Taylor Demke. I'm a junior also, and I'm majoring in philosophy. Uh, so our group is named Food Justice Co-Ops, um, and our pitch is as, it's 20 minutes away we got Trenton, a city of 85,000 people. A third of this population lives below the poverty line. Among the many problems facing these historically impoverished neighborhoods is that of malnutrition. Risks of obesity, diabetes, and hypertension are many times the national average. And we believe that these problems are directly related to the lack of access to affordable, healthy food. Our solution is the creation of a network of food justice co-ops, cooperatively run organizations that purchase bulk quantities of locally produced healthy food and distribute it to their members at cost. These co-ops will also exploit recent innovations in urban agriculture, such as high productivity greenhouses, aquaponics, and rooftop beekeeping to further generate revenue. Ultimately, the success of our project lies in effective community organizing. We've gotten strongly positive responses from Pam Mount, the mayor of Lawrenceville and director of Farmer Against Hunger, and Jack Ball, the mayor of Ewing and manager of the Trenton Farmers Market. We've also begun collaborating with OILS, the largest community development organization in Trenton, who've given us initial guidance as, a, as, as to our initial steps and have asked us to produce a report on the same. Our cooperative model organizes economic activity. It aligns individual interests with the collective by giving members a tangible, monetary stake in the process of rebuilding their community. It's a model that we can develop and perfect in Trenton and then scale up to other inner city food deserts in New Jersey, such as Patterson, Newark, and Camden. We have already hit the ground in Trenton and plan to initiate a food justice pilot program by the end of this summer. As for the long term, we believe we have the drive and energy to push forward our vision of social change. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Hello, I'm Danielle Cohen-Show, and currently I'm considering a few majors. <laughs> So there are still 1.4 billion people that live below the poverty line in developing countries despite the large number of organizations that seek to employ them through craft making. But I don't think this situation is necessarily hopeless. Every year, American consumers spend $330 billion on clothing and homeware goods, and just a thin slice of this $330 billion pie is spent on socially conscious goods. That means that expanding the amount American consumers spend on socially conscious goods could have enormous potential to employ more artisans worldwide. Thus, Freedom Fashion, a nonprofit marketing firm, aims to expand the spending of Western consumers on these goods through clever distribution and marketing strategies. It's simple. More purchases of these crafts will lead to higher income and more employment for those in abject poverty. So how are we going to do it? Freedom Fashion will partner with existing craft organizations like World of Good and 10,000 Villages to devise a list of products that we can promote. We will then use popular social networking sites that our generation grew up with, Facebook, MySpace, and Twitter, to build a large consumer base and start a socially conscious consumer movement. Other websites like YouTube provide us with free advertising space. We can not only promote the product, but also educate consumers about the problem. And so by partnering with these existing craft organizations, we feel we will dramatically reduce our startup costs and can start devoting our time and energy to providing a crucial service that these organizations need to increase demand. And tonight, we leave you with something to think about. That if you change your clothes, 
you can change the world. <laughs>
was to create more opportunities for students to do real, impactful, meaningful work, create change in their communities through the academic work that they're already doing. We spend hours doing problem sets, writing papers, researching, reading, and there's no reason why a vast majority of these hours couldn't also be cross-applied to meet the ends of our community partners. Um, and Princeton has a great network of community partners and organizations we do fantastic work with. So currently there's one organization on campus that serves this role. It's called the Community-Based Learning Initiative, and they do really fantastic work. They match professors with community partners that need questions answered in the form of research, which we're already doing here at the university. But CBLI is working in a space that has some constraints. They have constraints in terms of how many people they have working at the office currently. They have some financial and monetary constraints that prevent them from offering the kind of incentives that would hopefully mobilize more faculty members to take advantage of this opportunity. And they also have the disadvantage of not being students on this campus. So my team and I looked at each other and thought, we know what the barriers are to civic engagement through academics on campus. If you provide a disincentive for students to participate by making the civic engagement work in addition to the existing coursework, you're not going to get the bite you're looking for. So as students, LINK, our organization, is going to work in this space to answer these problems. Um, and the mechanism we propose for doing the majority of this work is a summer intern core. So these summer interns will work in the CBLI office and complement the work that CBLI is doing and they will vigorously and dynamically expand the network of faculty that know these opportunities exist. We know our professors, we know what their research interests are, and we know which ones are teaching courses that have, for example, student-selected uh, final projects. If you can choose your own final project, you can choose to answer a community question. We also know what courses are doing work that's very closely in line with the spirit of a lot of our community partners' work. So we'll work on expanding that faculty network. We'll also work on incorporating more of our uh, university community partners into CBLI's network. So we have more opportunities to do this matching with professors and thus expose all of the professor's students to this kind of work. Um, so this is our model. Right now we're in talk to CBLI about the curriculum of the internship and funding of that internship. And we're really excited about this opportunity to expose many more, but basically multiply the opportunities for civic engagement on this campus through the existing course structures that already exist. Thank you so much. Hey guys, uh, my name is Trey Spain, and this is our team leader, Kelly Robertson. Um, she will be in the pitch, so I will give a big thank to Mrs. Bloom and the rest of our class. Um, really, this is the class that I've met some of the most ambitious and the same lot for Princeton, some of the most ambitious Princeton students um, here, and it's just a great group of 40, 50 students um, that help us through that tremendous. 74? Oh, wow. Um, 74 students that has helped us tremendously with fighting the project, you know, off the map, and here's our pitch. I also want to introduce you to Noak. She is the most important part of our team. Um, she's a sea gypsy in southern Thailand, and in 2004, when the tsunami hit, her house, job, family, and life was truly devastated. So we have gone into to help women like Noak. Another woman will help is Sawai. She saw prostitution as the only way to provide food for her family and was forced to work late hours in bars while her six-year-old son would wander the streets at night. So over the past four years, our organization, It's a Rough, which was started by Kelly Robertson with $1,000 initial capital in Thailand, um, has, for, has both employed and trained women like these two women um, to make high-quality handbags that we then sell in the U.S. market. Our mission is to eliminate the two million prostitutes in Thailand today. That's an incredible amount, and we see our, our work as extending far into the future. And as well, we partner with organizations on the ground right now that literally rescue these women out from their current employment and their current trafficking situations into very sustainable forms of operations run entirely by our Thai employees. And we not only seek to empower, not only seek to employ, but also empower these women by partnering with social service organizations on the ground that provide things like education, 
childcare in the future, possibly healthcare and counseling services. Now, our product is unique in that we target a socially conscious market of consumers in the luxury goods market. Um, this is a very new market that's emerging because of the fact that people are becoming a lot more socially conscious in their buying habits, and we're trying to target them with a unique marketing strategy of popular media through our connections with people in Vogue magazine, Skirt magazine, and celebrities such as We Through This Film. Now, our model and our marketing distribution stream are completely replicable. And so in the next couple of years, we have planned to expand ITSRA to four other production sites in Thailand and eventually into international markets. By supporting ITSRA, you can help the women like Nook and Sawai truly experience freedom and help and create a brand that can change the world. Thank you. Okay, great. So, uh, now I know that, uh, so Sun Salute, are you here? Because I know that Eden had a lab, and she was running late in her lab, and she said, well, I will, t I will just tell you very briefly uh, two things about Sun Salute. So, it's a, it's a quite extraordinarily innovative um, solar technology, which will, I think, have an important impact on the developing world, involving a tracking device that the main entrepreneur on the team, um, Eden Full, who's actually a freshman in the engineering school, uh, developed, and uh, she's also an Ashoka Lemlinson fellow. We'll be traveling to India to um, to work uh, out some pilot projects for her technology and, and a great team. So, um, veterans campaign. You can get the photo. Hi, I'm Seth Lin. I apologize for that. Um, and uh, I'm a master's candidate at the Woodrow Wilson School. And uh, my partner in crime over there is Norm Bonnyman, who's a sophomore. He's double majoring in ROTC and the organization I'm about to tell you about. And our third member of our crew is actually not here right now. He's getting ready for our staff meeting tonight. So, you know, he had a little uh, you know, more important things to do, but the rest of us decided to come. Um, I want to start by asking you two questions. First is, would you like to see politicians who put their country before themselves? And would you like to see politicians who value bipartisanship more? If you answered yes, please hold that thought. Forty years ago, three out of every four elected leaders in the Senate and Congress had served in the military. Now, at the start of the Iraq and Afghanistan war, that had dropped to only one in three. And more importantly, since then, it's dropped even further to about one in five. Now, at Veterans Campaign, we believe that people who have risked their lives to serve the country overseas are going to take that same selflessness with them when they serve in public office. And their shared experiences, their common experience of service, will help them reach across partisan lines. Uh, but unfortunately, these same qualities don't really help people on the campaign trail. And so you're left with a huge pool of potential elected leadership. Um, that's not being utilized. So at Veterans Campaign, we're the first nonpartisan organization that trains veterans to run for office. And we've designed a comprehensive training program utilizing uh, a lot of people who've worked with veterans to get them into office before. And um, we've already trained 75 veterans at our first workshop here at Princeton in September. Uh, in February, we're having another workshop at GW in DC. We're going to train 150 more. And uh, if you, you know, for those of you who have your laptops open, there are a few of you, you can check out our website, which is veteranscampaign.org. And you'll see uh, great reviews from um, the attendees and great stories about us from uh, media organizations that covered us. Um, today's Veterans Day, or at least a week ago when I first gave this presentation, it was Veterans Day. <laughs> and uh, so a lot of people ask me, you know, what can I do for veterans? Uh, a week ago you were asking that. And um, my answer is, is, you know, most of us really don't want sympathy. What we really want is to continue serving our country and take the leadership in, uh, we, we have and, and to keep serving. And um, so if you guys, any of you know a veteran you think would make a great elected leader, take him to our website, veteranscampaign.org, and let him sign up there, and we'll take care of the rest. Thank you very much. So what we're going to do now, we're going to ask Rachel Steinberg to come up and say hello. Um, and we're going to set up for a little bit of a deeper dive with the, the team in power. So, uh, so Rachel. And in power, you can come up. Hi, I'm Rachel Steinberg, I help Gordon with the lab. And 
I guess when Gordon was asking me to kind of give my background and how I first became involved, I thought back to uh, when I took off sophomore semester and was working at the private sector of the World Bank in Washington, D.C. Um, actually, it, to May 2008, when I was sitting in a bar with my friend Pierre, and I was telling him that I was going to take a social entrepreneurship class, which was actually, uh, I guess, the one kind of before uh, Professor Bloom came uh, with Professor Danner. And so he immediately told me not to take it because he said that I would probably find it kind of boring. So I <laughs> ended up not signing up for it and sitting in a different lecture. And then kind of in the second week of school, I just by chance decided to go and sit in Professor Danner's social entrepreneurship lab and then immediately decided to switch classes. Um, and then I guess fast forward to spring of 2009 um, when Gordon contacted me to work in the lab with him because I had met him in, he was a guest speaker in Professor Danner's class. Uh, so I had met him then and then I guess he got my name from Professor Danner again and I was sitting in actually in a, the airport in Nairobi going to visit my friend Pierre who was working at Tanzania um, just by coincidence and uh, and he, you know, I first realized that that's, you know, he was kind of asking me to participate. So I, I immediately um, decided that I would help him out and switch around my class schedule. And then, uh, you know, kind of when I told Pierre about this, he also quickly asked me for my syllabus from Professor Danner's class and kind of uh, said that he was glad that I took it instead of listening to him say that it'd be boring. So that's kind of my background of the involvement with the SU lab. And it's been going really fabulously so far, and I appreciate all the, the work that I get to do with Gordon and Derek and all the students. You want to give, uh, you want to say something about the merge? Yeah, and on, um, <laughs> okay, so, um, so Gordon mentioned before that Iqbal Kadir, who, who started Grammy Phone, um, and being with that, he so he's actually going to come to speak at Princeton on December 2nd. He'll speak in our class first, and then he'll speak at a lecture sponsored by an organization that I started uh, on campus called Emerge, a Global Bazaar. So he'll do the keynote you know, lecture for that, and that's Wednesday, December 2nd at 4.30. Um, and then on Sunday, we have a big bazaar where we partner international artisan groups with student groups and uh, I guess in related departments and faculty on campus that are presenting kind of international oriented um, projects that they're doing or development initiatives. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have to say that there's absolutely no way I could do the SE Lab without Rachel. So thank you, Rachel. Um, okay, now what we're going to do is Empower is going to give their full presentation that they did actually last night. It's 10 minutes long. And then you have in front of you these feedback sheets. And you're welcome if you want to scribe notes. And uh, you'll see the way that we actually work to help the students and give them feedback. And we look at such things as, I'm sure that I know it by heart, but anyway. But this, their problem statement, the opportunity and the mission that they've articulated, the solution and the theory of change, the social value creation, the management and advisory team, the market, the business model and financials, and the performance measurement and evaluation are not being done right now because they're at midterm, so those are being done in the following weeks and then for the final business plan that they're writing. And uh, then there's strategic partners and scale and the overall effectiveness of the presentation. And on the back, you'll see there are ways to note the three greatest strengths, the three limiting weaknesses, what recommendations you think that the team should do immediately, and any suggestions for people, organizations, the team should contact. I think they might hang out for the reception, and you can you can also uh, get them there. Um, these guys have been working incredibly hard, and I want you to know that all of these projects basically started, um, well, this one certainly started from uh, from scratch in the lab, and uh, Fazio had already been in, 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 in Pakistan and, and, and been involved with this group, but um, I'm quite amazed, actually, at the... Uh, the, the rapid pace. This is really a rapid um, prototyping incubator, and um, and you need to have talented students to do it. Thank you so much. I will just quickly introduce ourselves. My name is Faisal Luck. I'm a computer science student, and um, yeah, I'm glad to be working with this amazing thing, which I'll introduce itself. Hi, my name is Dahlia Nell. I'm a junior in sociology and environmental studies. Hi, I'm Jake Hiller. Uh, I'm a senior chemistry major, uh, also doing pursuing certificates in, in environmental studies and sustainable energy. I'm Fahad Shams, and I'm a second in Austin in finance student. 
Uh, my name is Michael Smith. Uh, I'm a senior in the mobile bio department. Can, can you hear? I hate these. Things. <laughs> you sound evil. Uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Perfect. Good. <laughs> so I want you to picture a community of 2,000 people living on a landfill where 3,000 tons of urban garbage are dumped every day. <laughs> To make a living, they search through garbage, looking for recyclables, and they burn away all of the organic waste to make their tasks easier, causing grave health problems. This is Kashar Kandi in Karachi, Pakistan, a place that epitomizes the waste of valuable resources in landfill slums throughout the world. So Kashar Kandi is located on the outskirts of Karachi, Pakistan, which is a huge city of 18 million people. Um, the people on this landfill live in shanty dwellings. Um, and basically what we want to address on this um, pilot site um, is the problem of landfill slums, which occurs throughout the world. Um, this problem has two underlying problems. One of the problems is severe poverty, which manifests itself in low margin inefficient work, um, a small amount of opportunities, limited educational resources, um, and the second problem is urban waste. Um, overflow. So urban waste overflow um, contributes huge in a huge way um, to um, climate change. Um, it also, as I mentioned before, um, contributes to grave health problems on this site. Um, and this is this is uh, exacerbated by the burning of organic waste on this site. So this last challenge actually becomes the first input into empowers equation of change. So it's a huge, um, unutilized resource, uh, organic waste that is dumped um, at the landfill site and it's just burned away because the workers lack the requisite skills um, or resources to utilize this resource. Um, previously, large corporations have tried to come on site and use uh, the waste to produce electricity, but have failed because they tried to evict the community first. And that actually led to violence. Um, so Empower's model is fundamentally different. We use uh, this huge, huge unutilized resource, which is uh, organic waste, and combine that with inexpensive, proven biogas technology to produce methane. And that methane we use to produce electricity. But instead of evicting the community, uh, we use this electricity to empower them, to empower the workers on site to become agents of positive change in their own surroundings. Uh, I was working on site um, the last year and I met these kids who wouldn't go to school in the morning because uh, the school was at capacity, the school that is on site um, and which is actually our main partner in this endeavor. Um, and that's the capacity, so they would just run around, um, play on the trash because that's their playground and um, you know, run around barefoot on the shards of glass and not even wince and I would wince for them. Um, and then, you know, uh, these, the wounds that would, they would get here would complicate drastically, very quickly, because the health clinic sometimes won't be uh, able to store medicines or vaccines on site. So, you know, we use this electricity um, to power up the school and the health clinic, uh, thereby increasing their capacity and capability. So the school, for example, uh, can now have evening shifts, uh, thereby catering to more students on site, and the health clinic can, for example, have a fridge which can store medicines um, and vaccines on site. Um, but this is not the end. We want this project to be sustainable, to be self-sustaining. We, we, we don't want it to rely continuously on aid. So this electricity actually becomes the nucleus uh, for a host of value-added community-owned businesses um, that introduce new monetary and social value in the community. Uh, these businesses include um, a compost production uh, and you know producing upcycled products at the site and an outdoor cinema and agriculture and food sales. These all work under an integrated co-op model um, that JCare will talk more about. Yeah, so as Bai has described, uh, Empower seeks to be kind of an umbrella organization for a large number of community-owned businesses. Um, but how exactly would this work? Uh, so this is a diagram of the few acres immediately surrounding the existing school and health clinic uh, located on Kachukundi. Um, so the best way to understand this is to follow the waste. You st we start over at the recyclable sorting plant, where waste is taken directly from the landfill, mixed waste, both recyclables and organic, about 40% organic, 
and it's taken him to our recyclable sorting plant where a number of employees um, employed by our co-op will sort out the organic waste from the recyclables. The recyclables will be sold to wholesalers just like they're being done now. But instead of throwing away the organic waste, it'll now be moved into our biodigester. Now what is a biodigester? Basically, it's a very large concrete tank built underground where organic waste and water are mixed, sealed, and allowed to ferment in order to create methane. There are two main outputs from a biodigester. One is the methane that goes out the top through the pipe. The other is a very highly nutrient-rich sludge, which comes out the bottom of the tank. So we'll follow the two outputs to understand how we're going to gain um, economic value from both of these. First, the methane can go directly to a methane generator, where electricity is produced in order to power the school, the health clinic, and the, new, the other new businesses that uh, Fai has outlined. Then, the high, highly nutrient-rich sludge can be moved to an adjacent tank, where it can be mixed with additional organic waste in order to create high-quality compost. Now, currently, the school offers lunches to all of its students every day, but it has to bring in this food from off-site. It's expensive, and it's really not the most environmentally friendly perspective. We believe that we can create an on-site agricultural area where we can use this high-quality compost in addition to the cheap building materials to build a, a raised bed in order to, um, to, to produce local, fresh produce for this school and uh, therefore supply this need. Startup funds for this project are low. $10,000 will give us enough money to build the biodigester, buy our 5 kVA uh, methane generator, provide wiring for the school, the health clinic, and the other new businesses, and the building materials for our agricultural site. This will allow us to form these community-owned businesses that can hire employees directly from the existing community. The school and the health clinic have already agreed to purchase the electricity and the food from our co-op, providing our initial revenue stream. From this revenue, we'll be able to pay all of our employees a fixed wage that's higher than they're currently making scavenging on the landfill. Additionally, out of all the excess revenue that we'll generate, which we've calculated will be plenty, uh, we will redistribute this back to the workers in a mixture of wage bonuses based on performance, how well they're doing, how much value they're producing for the co-op, in addition to shares in the, in, the, um, in the cooperative. This will allow for two things. One, it'll allow the community to buy into our venture. And two, uh, it will allow us to repay the initial $10,000 investment. Once this, is, this investment has been paid off, uh, the, community, the cooperative will be 100% community owned, and our group will be able to reinvest that $10,000 in phase two, which Baha'i will talk about a little more fully. So our project will be implemented in three phases, and with each successive phase, uh, we'll get into an increasingly larger market. In phase one, we'll be providing electricity to the on-site school, the health clinic, uh, and our community-owned businesses. And as Jake mentioned, we'll be generating revenues by selling the products of these businesses to consumers in Karachi, and potentially other areas of Pakistan and abroad. And a portion of these revenues would go towards investing in phase two of our plan. In phase two, We'll be scaling up our power plant and we'll be providing electricity to a majority of the residents of Kachra Kundi, which is roughly 2,000 individuals or 400 households. Uh, we'll be selling the electricity at a very subsidized, affordable price. And finally, in phase three, uh, using the profits that we've made till date and with an extra round of funding, uh, we'll scale up even more uh, and we'll get into the larger market of Karachi city by selling electricity to the grid. I was in Karachi this past summer, and the city is facing a severe energy deficit. There were blackouts all the time, and there's definitely a need for this. So a quick overview of our team. Uh, Empower is a group of 100 plus uh, Princeton and Rutgers undergraduate and graduate students, and we here represent the core team. Uh, our core team has an eclectic set of academic interests, which include environmental science, engineering, sociology, and finance. Uh, we believe the diversity and relevance of our areas of study will definitely uh, prove to be a great asset during the course of this project. Plus, uh, we have two Pakistanis on our team, which will help us understand the cultural and political context. And last but not the least, Faiz here has already worked on site and has developed a thorough understanding of the ground realities and has built local partnerships. Uh, we realize that we need help. Uh, so in order to ensure our project success, we formed a meaningful partnership with EcoComplex, which is Rutgers University's Environmental Research Center, which focuses on projects related to waste management and renewable energy. 
Plus, we are seeking advice from a range of esteemed experts within academia, which include Candice Chandra, who is an expert in waste management at the Woodrow Wilson School there. In Pakistan, we formed a partnership with the well-known uh, Ackerman Fund, and we are looking to partner with uh, the city government in Karachi. And most importantly, on site, we made local uh, close connections with uh, Al Qaed Foundation, which is running the on-site school and health plan, and which will help us build the infrastructure for our community-owned businesses, and will provide us with the necessary human capital. Um, this foundation is highly respected by the local community and the landlords. Uh, so this will help us gain community support, which is crucial for the success of this project. All right, so there's obviously some challenges, because if this uh, proposal were easy, it'd already be done. Uh, as far as we consider some of our problems we may be facing in the future, the first one is resource competition. Right now, the organic materials, they're not doing anything with them. If we go in there and start making money off of it, who's to say someone else isn't going to do the same? Our second problem is the community buy-in. It's essential to our project to have the community support us within our endeavors. Without their support, we don't exist. Our third problem is theft and corruption. Obviously, this is a disadvantaged community, and anything of value could can potentially be a problem. But I think you'll find out that our competitive advantages do a pretty good job of blowing these out of the water. Our first one is our community connection. Fez here has the gold stamp of approval from this group that's been there since 1983, working on site without electricity. They want us to come. They're excited for us to come. When we arrive on site, we're not the crazies coming from elsewhere. We're the people that are there helping the community with the community. Our second big advantage is our scalability. This is something that we can make bigger, we can make better, and Karachi needs electricity, so we can actually turn this into real cash inflow. Our third advantage is really, I think, the most important, other than the community, and that's our technology. It's easy, it's quick, it's efficient, it exists. If you go to Home Depot and you buy yourself a generator, that uses gasoline. You put an adapter on that, you pump methane in it, and shazam, you've got electricity. That's what we're using. That's why our startup costs are so low, and with $10,000, we can start a pilot, not tomorrow because we have to finish the semester, but by the end of the year for sure. <laughs> I'm serious. My mom is like, no way you're going to Pakistan. Uh, she actually said that. Um, <laughs> if, if I can really leave you with one thing to really take out of this idea is that we're taking trash, we're turning it to gas. We take the gas, we make electricity, and we take the electricity and we turn it into cash. $10,000 are on the ground, and I'm excited, we're excited, and we hope you guys are excited too. Thank you very much, Dean. And there you have some copies of their executive summary. This is what I'd like to do for our, our last 15 minutes here. I'd like to just open up the floor. We have questions. You can direct them any way you like. Um, you can direct them to uh, Empower or any of the teams that have said hello or to me or, or as you like. So um, questions. And I have a mic here if you want a mic. So we have questions out there? Questions for the teams? When yes. When is the class going to be offered again? When is the class going to be offered again? Uh, Sherrod and Vince are the only people who can answer. No, the professorship is a... Um, it rotates each year, so there'll be a new visiting professor in entrepreneurship uh, in this role, and uh, that person will teach what it is that is their particular innovation in the in the curriculum. So uh, the short answer is this class will not be taught next year in the current plan. Any other questions? Questions for the teams? Yeah, I'd especially like. This is a question for the Veterans Campaign. What you finish? Oh, okay. It seems to me you're going to get a disproportionate number of men in your um, campaign, which will increase the uh, disproportionate of women in elected office. It's funny you mentioned that. Actually, uh, we got our idea from a similar organization at Rutgers that does this for women. Um, and, yeah, sorry. Yeah, so, so we, we actually got that same idea. It, I think it's actually, you, you're, you're absolutely right, there are about 15% of veterans are women. Um, and I, yeah, I, I, there are definitely a, a drawbacks to that, and I think that both organizations are, are taking uh, a pool of, of talent that could be great elected leadership. And we're not saying that only veterans should be, uh, should be in office, and we're not saying, I, I'm ready to run, is not saying that only women should be in office. I think both organizations are basically just saying, here are some people that would really make great elected leaders, and, and we're not utilizing them enough, and so let's give them the opportunity to do so. Um, 
and we definitely are making it our um, our business to reach out to uh, to women in the uh, veterans community. Um, we're hoping to have uh, Tammy Duckworth, who, who ran last time and lost, but is now um, working at the Veterans Administration in uh, in D.C. Uh, speak at our next our next event, and we have people, other veterans who are politicians, um, who are part of our board, who are helping us reach out to that part of the community. Because it, and it, if you'll see the pictures of our first conference, it, it was very heavily uh, you know male dominated, and we wanted to make sure that that. Uh, women who have served feel just as welcome to come to the, uh, the conferences as men do. You want to say something about your plans for where you're going to where you're going to take this? Um, sure. Uh, we, basically, the, the plan is to um, continue uh, a lot more of these workshops at different universities throughout the U.S. Um, GW was the first one we've worked with um, since Princeton, and uh, we also have some interest from some out on the West Coast, but you know, at, at um, in the Northern California area. Basically, the idea for a financial standpoint from universities is that the new GI Bill provides a lot of money, especially for graduate school. And for programs um, like that aren't as, as well funded as, as Princeton is, you know, it's really hard to get guys to come to programs, you know, the, the, the most talented people to come to these programs if they're not getting a, you know, an MBA or a JD or something, they can, they can pay that, um, that loan back. Um, and so, They've realized that they're going to have a lot of, of better quality students that can actually pay their own tuition by bringing people who've served uh, in, you know, and giving them exposure to their schools. So it's actually in, in GW's best interest. They, what, what, the guys sponsoring it are from the Graduate School of Political Management, and they're hoping that some of the people who don't want to run right now but come to this conference and sort of are exposed to their, their school will want to come and be students at their school. And that will actually sort of help help both of us in that, in that case. So that's that's the way we're looking at you know, part of the financial plan. We also have um, we're, you know looking for grants, obviously, from both uh, individuals who you know contributed to veterans' causes in the past, as well as corporations who contributed to both veteran co veteran causes and education. Um, and what you know what's, what's really really pretty impressive, I think, is, is among the alumni who went to our first conference, a bunch have already pledged to donate. Uh, we are waiting for our uh, our 501c3 um, you know uh, tax exempt status to come in. Uh, the IRS seems to be going a little bit slow this month, but we're hoping to have it by the end of the month. And uh, once that happens, we're actually going to reach out to all our alumni. And since we provided these workshops for free, a lot of them said, "Hey, well, you know, I, I could have afforded this. I want to donate, you know, whatever it costs." And so you know, we're hoping to get a lot of funding from there as well. Excellent. That's great. Excellent. Um, yeah. Um, I have two questions. One is for um, actually your team. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thanks to the groups. This is fascinating. Um, my first question is for veterans campaign. Um, I'm wondering if you have considered um, if there might be, like let's say your group is successful, you're starting to see more veterans in office, which would certainly be very interesting in terms of um, policy changes that you might see as a result of that. And I'm wondering, um, what do you foresee might be some of the consequences in terms of policy um, that we might see as a result of having more veterans in office? Um, obviously, you have some who are, you know, very interested in not having a war, having experienced that. Some might feel differently, and I'm wondering what um, you see the uh, the consequences might be to that um, yeah, on either question. side. Great question. Um, first of all. Veterans are pretty much the most bipartisan group you'll find in office. There are currently um, 108 congressmen and congresswomen who are veterans, 54 Democrats, 54 Republicans. There are 25 senators who are veterans, 13 are Democrats, 12 are Republicans. Thank you. So it's, it's really right down the middle. And, and studies have actually been done about you know what kind of policy changes happen uh, when there are more veterans in office. Um, the only article I've read that and this is actually it's, it's pretty controversial, but the idea being that there's the country's less likely to go to war when more veterans are in office. Now, what I told you at the beginning, 1969, there were a lot of uh, of veterans in office at the time, 75%. We were in the thick of the Vietnam War. I'm not sure if that just proves it or not. So I don't want to sell that as, as one of our you know our, our talking points. Um, it really isn't about a certain policy for us. Um, and people say, well, what do you think would happen, you know, would have happened in the run-up to the Iraq war had there been more veterans in office? And like you said, there are people who say, you know, I, I'm a veteran, I want to make sure there aren't any more wars, there are guys who are more hawkish. Um, 
and, and again, this is not about any particular issue for us. All I would say to that is that I think, given the experience that veterans have, the conversation to lead up to that conflict would have um, been a lot more realistic. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you. More questions? I actually, sorry, I have a second question. Um, oh, you have another one? Can, yes. can, can, I, can I see for, for a, different, a, different, a different group? To the room, yes. Okay. To the room. Oh, okay. No, no, I'm saying so, <laughs> okay. If there aren't any others, I'll pass them right back. Yes. So, uh, uh, Gene, you are first. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I'd like to know if the products of Freedom by Design are available anywhere. And if so, how can we spread the word? Wow. Okay. Great. And you know what, I just want to make a quick comment as I hold, as I hold that question. Um, what I'm reminded of, which I think is very important for Princeton, we have wonderful representation from, I think we have uh, students from 16 different majors of the 32 majors. We have, a, we have a strong group from Woodrow Wilson, both graduate and undergraduate. I think we have 10 or 11 graduate students from Woodrow Wilson, uh, including a sort of representation of, of the veterans team and a number of others, uh, IDM, the, the Chinese, uh, China, uh, Africa team, and uh, a team that's not here this evening is doing a water filter for uh, a water filtration uh, technology for Nigeria that's, um, that they want to pilot in India and Pakistan and, and uh, El Salvador and Mexico, which is their four countries of national origin. Um, in any case, what I've noticed, and Vince, you're the one who reminded me of this. So um, Vince Port, the dean of the engineering school, and I were having a conversation at the, at the Friends Center building, and he said, no, Gordon, I mean, in my day, this was a parking lot. And what I've realized is this incredible axis that's developing between the engineering school and the Woodrow Wilson School, amongst other places around campus. And we need that sort of interdisciplinary cooperation in order to attack these, these global problems. Um, I'm seeing it. This building is actually a, another uh, a wonderful uh, piece of that puzzle. Uh, and my um, colleague Andrew Selvison, Andrew's right here, has been helping with the lab. It's tremendous from the Pace Center. The Pace Center has two people on the third floor here. So we're really starting to populate this end of campus, the Sherrard Hall and the activities there, which is shared between Woodrow Wilson and Engineering School. And uh, it's, it's a very, very active space. So I, I'm imagining that in in, uh, in 15 to 20 years, certainly, we have the $100 million uh, Angler Center for Energy and the Environment coming uh, to the EQUAD as well. So what an amazing time, uh, and what a set of interesting opportunities. Uh, and I think in 15 or 20 years, certainly, when you come to this spot, it will no longer be on one end of the campus, and it will no longer be a distant end of the campus. A lot of students that are coming to the EQUAD, you know, they say, well, I've never been here before. <laughs> I said, well, you're welcome. Um, anyway, so freedom fashion. Uh, no, I'm sorry, it's Sarah. It's Sarah. Where are you, Callie? So, Callie, look at first. This is our product. This is our product that we're currently selling that's made by the victims of human trafficking, um, the sea gypsies in Southern Thailand. And we have these on sale. Um, we're actually running low on our shipment, but we're, the next one's on its way, so it's just a matter of time. And it's made from swamp grass. We're also working on a leather line, a uh, woven leather line for the, for the victims of human trafficking. So we'll be at Emerge on December 6th, selling them in Chancellor Green. And um, you can also talk to me. I think you have a customer over there. <laughs> Do you have a website? Yes, Right, it's in the, it's in the program there, the, uh, the name. So any more questions? I think we could probably take one or two more. <clears throat> Is there a way for the Princeton community to continue to track as these different ideas and businesses develop? And secondly, because for freedom fashion as well as for um, freedom by design, I think there's a local market that can be like Okay, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pass the mic to my boss. I could do my boss's boss, I suppose, but we'll go with we'll go with uh, Sherrod and ask him. And I know that there's also a trustees meeting tomorrow, so it's it's it's, it's a good time to try to think about that question. <laughs> yeah, I think that's, that's a great idea. So uh, we'll we'll use uh, the Kettle Center website. We'll figure out a plan to try and track these projects and uh, have them have a life after uh, the course. Thanks. 
I've never had resources to track the many hundreds of students that I've had at Stanford and Harvard, so it would be something if, if, if Princeton was, was faster and smarter at doing it. Um, and I think, it would, it would, I think that the, the, the results would be pretty interesting. Um, one last question. Anyone? You want me to come? Oh. Yeah? Um, yes, I, uh, it's wonderful. My fabulous colleague Jane from the architecture school. Yes, so, um, and I had a kind of great chance of sitting in the seminar earlier this semester. So it's um, my question to a number, in, in a sense it's, it's, it's oh, sorry, um, it makes my voice even worse. Um, the question I have, particularly for, I think, the Trenton team, and the team that were talking about the um, Chinese-African relation and, and bridge building, where, where does, uh, in a sense that their questions are two, the kind of instances at two radically different scales, but in Trenton it seems that there would be great possibilities to begin to think about the kind of urban and architectural implications of that. But um, yeah, the, the, it seems to me that in the strategy of the kind of food production, that there are the, the, the kind of physical location and organisation of that, and how you really exploit that, the, those decisions at that level, could really make it even stronger as a proposition. So my question would be. Um, you know, how might, I mean, it's not really, it's more a rhetorical question for today, but maybe that's something to think about, it, you know, down the line. And I think at a, at a more complex um, scale with the Chinese, um, the, the kind of question of the kind of Chinese investment in Africa, but so fraught with tremendous complexities about the way in which the investment is being used to marginalize groups and build ammunition factories, and I mean, there's a whole other, kind of story there that you did not, in a sense, touch on. And it seems to me what you're doing is, has got tremendous potential that is a very, very complicated enterprise. And how do you begin to no negotiate the, the kind of complexity with the, with the kind of focus of the proposition? Of course, yeah, no, wait, wait a second, because I'm glad that Jane asked the simplest question of the entire evening at the very, at the very end, but has always been wonderful in, in, in lab, so. If anyone can handle it. That's a, that's a great question, and it's definitely a question that we've been grappling with, and we, we fully understand that this is an extremely, extremely sensitive space, and we only had 90 seconds to pitch today, and you know, if you want to have this discussion, it could be a five, six hour long conversation, you know. Um, but really, we have a bigger vision and mission, but then where we start, um, how to start. We, the reason we chose DRC is because Dane, the, the team leader, spent six years in DRC, has some experience there, has really, so he already has some contacts on the ground, he also spent three years in China, so he's really studying that space also. And the reason we chose the um, skill transfer is because it's the, uh, I would say, less polit political issue to start with, because we really want to make sure that when we start, we start in a way that we do not harm our credibility on the way. So. That's why we, you know, we're still thinking a lot about like how to start, how to best start. Yeah. If I could just add to that, um, in addition to skills transfer, we also have talked about sort of health analysis of sort of building roads in addition, in connection with mines, and how what that might do for disease transmission or access to medical facilities. All of these things that you know they're going to build a road, and there are like no roads in the DRC. You can't try to drive from one side of the country to the other. So they're going to build roads, but you know, if you do build roads, you know, how is that going to affect the local community? And these are things that aren't being done. And we think that we can do those kinds of analyses and people will listen to us more easily because like with the skills transfer, it's not something that is very sensitive. Whereas if we start attacking the environmental issue head on, you know, we could just get shut out from a lot of these companies. So we are, our approach is going to be very project specific and sort of very nuanced. And it's also going to depend on the personal connections that we sort of develop, which is why the DRC is a good place for us to start with Dane's experience and his contacts there. 
You've got the last word. All right. Thank you. Um, thank you for your comment. Um, I think the urban agriculture aspect of our project is something we didn't really talk about in a 90 second pitch, but um, well, you probably know a lot more about this than I do, but Trenton is structurally designed to accommodate 150,000 people, but only 85,000 people live there. So there are a lot of empty spaces that we can use uh, or utilize to produce uh, herbs and uh, other things and sell them in Trenton, the Trenton Farmers Market, other places to generate revenue to supplement the food go up. And so we are actually in the process of building a pilot program uh, for a greenhouse right here on campus, which we can hopefully expand to Trenton over the summer. And then, uh, as mentioned, we're looking at things like beekeeping, which require, you can set it, set it up on a rooftop, it requires very little effort, uh, very little time, and very little startup costs. And honey is a product that can be sold for much higher prices in the market. And that is something that is really yeah. important to what we're doing. And there are also two architecture students that are on that team right. that, that, that didn't come this evening. So, Jane, you have uh, two students in your studio oh, to work on that. Students. Alan and Alexander. Yeah, yeah. so, uh, sure, are we, um, yeah, we're off to, yeah. Right, um, so just, just to let everybody know, we have a, a small reception at the end of this event, so if you can just cross over as the room uh, right across uh, the corridor here. And uh, before I let you go, I'd, love to, I'd like to thank uh, Gordon for putting this uh, evening together, this group of students. And this has been, at least for me, and I expect for all of us, uh, been a wonderful uh, afternoon, evening, uh, with the students sharing their energy, their vision, and their plans. And uh, on behalf of all of us, I'd like to wish them good luck and hope to see every one of us. Thank you.